Christine, I really am pretty excited to talk to you. Um, we've talked a bit before, but now um, I'm really excited just to honestly learn more about your journey um, from studying um, chemistry at MIT to all the different fields that you've been touching over the years. So, yeah. Great, looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, so starting from, again, I'm really interested in your journey. And I was actually talking to a few friends of mine about, you know, I'm talking with Christine Peterson, she termed open source. And uh, of course the tech nerds were like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, so I always think it's kind of interesting to learn about the origin stories, right? Um, you studied chemistry at MIT, um, and, I th I th and I read that you were really inspired about the different um, activism, the different um, thoughts kind of going around university. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I grew had a pretty standard, grew up the way most of us do, just learning about the world mm -hmm. and really not thinking of the world uh, so much as a place that change as an individual. It's more like, oh, you know, what kind of world do I have to cope with? Mm. And it wasn't until it was, um, it was when I was at school at MIT that I started to be exposed to people who took a very different attitude, much more that the world is malleable and that mm. we as individuals can, can make major changes to it. Um, but I still, and, and I, I, I could see they felt that way, but I still didn't feel that way myself. Mm. Um, it wasn't until I got a little older in my early 20s that I realized, uh, wow, but wait, I could be one of those people too. Mm. Um, you know, it actually is possible not just for others, but for me as an individual to make possibly a substantial difference in the world um, either for, uh, and that can go either way of course you know so uh, yeah and the area that I first figured that out in was not in nanotechnology but more in um, space as an outer space development and settlement mm -hmm. that was the first area that I became active in mm -hmm. tell me more about that I actually read about yeah your interest really started off with space settlement yeah right well you recall back in those days the thing that we all had was about limits to growth in mm -hmm. other words uh, resource mm -hmm. uh, and general a general feeling that we needed to still a major issue today so but that was the focus environmental uh constraints environmental cleanup so uh, we were realizing that, well, first of all, on the resource constraints, that only occurs uh, if you completely ignore the rest of the universe uh, and all of the resources that are available, even within our own solar system. Yeah. So the whole resource issue looks very different when you start to include space resources. Uh, and also this question of not polluting our own nest, in other words, is it really necessary to have all of the most high risk, the most polluting industries here on earth, which is the most high value real estate there is in the universe as far as we know, right? Mm -hmm. What sense does this make actually? It doesn't make sense at all, right? We should not be polluting here. So, um, so the feeling was, look, let's go, let's expand, um, let's expand humanities, um, activities into space. And the other benefit of that is, as we all know, um, over the long term, Earth is very vulnerable to, for example, asteroids and comets that can hit it. And this happens all the time, actually. Uh, and that's what killed the dinosaurs, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want the, the biosphere, not just humanity, but all of all living things that we're aware of in this universe, we don't want them restricted to one planet. That is unwise, right? Mm -hmm. It's And over time, that will eventually be a big problem. So, uh, so just for, for all three reasons, it's really important to expand uh, the biosphere off of Earth mm -hmm. to include other areas, first on our own solar system, then potentially beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, so that was the area where I first realized, gosh, um, we could, as individuals, we could start to try to move in that direction. And then there was a particular treaty up before the United Nations called the Moon Treaty. Uh, and and it, it had laid out a particular pathway for space resource development, mm -hmm. which some of us felt was so non-optimal that it would actually um, make it de delayed by immense amounts of time, if ever. So we thought, well, you know, maybe we should go down to Washington, D.C. and talk with our representatives and try to persuade them that this is not such a good idea. And I was very young. I had just started my very first job out of school uh, and announced to my boss that I was taking time off without pay. Here I was brand new, right? Taking time off without pay to go to Washington to, to uh, talk to my representatives about this issue. So, but they were okay with it. So down I went with a whole bunch of friends and uh, we found them very receptive, actually. Um, the Congress folks down there were actually quite interested to learn about this from a group of mostly very young people, very enthusiastic people um, who happened to know about this issue and wanted to educate the Congress folks. So uh, that went very well. We, they actually listened. Um, I'm not sure why, but, uh, but the U.S. did not participate in that treaty. It could have been some other reason. Maybe it wasn't our work that, that changed things. But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the treaty didn't go through in terms of the U.S. participation. And um, so that was an early sign to me that, whoa, gee, you know, a small group of people can actually have an impact. There's so many things uh, I, I want to say. So it's so interesting um, what you mentioned about um, coming from, you know, growing up and then coming to university. Suddenly it's it's figuring out like um, insulating from the world, like oh things, you know, can go wrong versus oh, we have an opportunity to create there. The, the, li it's, there's, the limits aren't where we think they are. So it's kind of fascinating how that kind of parallels your interest in space settlement um, of, of understanding are they are there actually a limited amount of resources what and where are they are they actually on earth or actually beyond so it's kind of an interesting parallel um and i think it's also too uh speaking of planetary resources i wrote an article about this particularly sp space water but you know there's a lot of other valuable um minerals etc up, up in space um but you know part of one of the space treaties is that there's just very little regulation, very little rules actually of play. Um, and there's, I, I think a lot of people don't actually realize that. Um, so when you were talking to congressmen, you know, Congress people, it was wonderful that they're receptive, but in general, did you have a feeling that they um, were just as new to this as, you know, the topic was, or I don't know, I'm, I'm curious. Well, definitely, this is uh, space was not and still is not high on the list of people in, uh, of interest areas for the great majority of Congress people. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would say this was came out of the blue to them. They probably had never heard of the treaty. They probably had never thought about space resources. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very likely that for most of them, our contact was the first time they'd ever been aware that there was even a, a, an issue to discuss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you, do you, are you at all tempted to draw parallels to today? Like in some ways it's, it's similar or maybe wrong. And, you know, there's a, been a, a big move in the past two years about climate change and, and being wise with our resources and understanding how we need to invite uh, the environment at our decision table. But then there's also an expansion, a realization of going to space. Like, do, does it feel similar? Or if it, if it doesn't, then what feels different? Well, at this point, mm -hmm. um, I think hopefully everyone in Congress is well aware of the climate issue. So that, uh, that, that part of it, they've got, they're aware that there's a concern. So mm -hmm. that, that is, that's different. Um, in terms of the space area, I think still um, it's it still is not 
high on the agenda, um, and understandably so. Um, the, the people that I've talked with who are in Congress, they're, they're very smart, very hardworking, but the number of issues that Congress attempts to deal with every year is so large mm -hmm. that no matter how smart and hardworking you are, you cannot keep up with it. Mm -hmm. So they count on others to come to them with information, um, preferably citizens, but if we don't do it, then they get their information from um, interested parties, right? people with an agenda um, who want to make money off something. So that's why we as citizens have to, and not just in the U.S., obviously, in any democracy, you need to speak with your representatives um, so, that they, so that they're not getting all their information from lobbyists, basically. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, and what's particularly different now is that we have these platforms, for good or bad, Twitter, uh, being one of them, where people can actually voice uh, their opinions or their, you know, kind of this citizen's perspective on certain issues, right? Um, but yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah, they can do that. But remember, you know, the Congress folks are not necessarily, they don't have a lot of time mm. to go on Twitter, right? They may have staffers who are trying to monitor what's going on. Mm -hmm. But we need to be, we as citizens need to be proactive uh, in reaching out uh, with our, with our, positions and we have to express them in ways that the Congress people are set up to accept them. Mm, okay. um, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. Just talking with each other on Twitter is a start. It's a beginning, but uh, if we really want to influence Congress or whatever our representative body is in whatever country we're in, we need to um, be more proactive and reach out right. to directly to them. Right. Right. And I didn't mean, you know, you know, just saying a tweet means you're participating as a, you know, a civic person. But it's it's fascinating that you know I think these kinds of platforms, these groups, inspire people to take action. You know, in in the ways that you mentioned that you know they Congress, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They absolutely do, and I think they perform a useful function in terms of finding other people who share your perspective. Right. And that's the first step, right? Um, you know, we have to. There's this whole general process that we're struggling, we're all struggling with now on sense making, mm -hmm. which is what the heck is going on? Um, the media have become much more polarized than they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting harder and harder to find um, sources of information that are not biased he heavily in some direction. Mm -hmm. So, um, even though obviously we know that social media am amplifies those differences, they also enable. If if we are trying to do sense making in a in a uh, in a rational, calm way, you can use those tools to do it. And I I certainly do that myself. Mm -hmm. um, I find I I learn a great deal of things from the context that I have on social media, and I've it's because I've curated that list pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. um, I like to. Uh, I like to get information from a wide variety of sources. And at this point, I get a lot of it through social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, again, like it's, it's, we can create these very curated environments and making sure that we integrate what well, ideally be a more an idealized environment is integrating it from different perspectives, ones that are, of course, well researched, people that are experts. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's to switch gears um, to kind of also draw a parallel to this is that you know there's so many kinds of um, sources of information um, and it's um, technology companies private technologies kind of controlling these hubs of information I'm you know curious from your perspective open source um, you know what this really means in terms of maybe open source information open source hubs collaborative groups um how possibly could you know it better work when it comes to you know curating better information per se yeah. well this is a tough one and we're all <laughs> i know i'm sorry i'm just giving you, know. you the i think the toughest you know challenge of the couple past couple years <laughs> yeah well they are they're big challenges yeah. um and uh, what I've seen in the social media world is, you know, the, the big tech companies are trying to, uh, they're trying to take out information that they think is damaging, but they don't always guess correctly on that, right? Mm -hmm. We know that. Mm 
-hmm. So um, what happens now is that is that people who care about free discussion and don't like the idea that the big companies are uh, editing their commentary and getting rid of certain ideas, they're moving off those platforms. They're moving to platforms that are less edited. For example, um, they're moving to Substack. Uh, videos are moving to Rumble. Um, discussions are going to Telegram. So basically, um, and I think that will continue. The, the people who want to have a free discussion will continue to migrate mm -hmm. until they find a place that is not so heavily uh, controlled because mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty appalling how, uh, heavily, how heavily things are being edited on the big platforms now. It's, right. And they, they, they're not guessing well. They're, not, they're, they're editing heavily and they're not being careful enough. So it's driving people away. Um, I still use the big platforms, but I, if I want to have frank discussions about controversial issues, I know I may have to go elsewhere. Mm, interesting. It's again, I didn't, I, think, I didn't think about this, but you know how they talk about how, of course, um, certain algorithms, right, from certain uh, private tech companies, you know, there's an instance of, of of radicalizing in general because it polarizes, right? It basically creates an echo chamber. Um, I'm wondering though too is will people in general even mix confuse radicalization and free software you know because they're they're two different ideas um, you know radicalizing means you know perhaps being on a certain side of an issue that um, is detrimental to other types of people right but then there's also free software it's just let's have a discussion about a controversial issue without being fairly edited um, do you think people could confuse those two or, yeah. I think sadly, the vast majority of folks are, um, they're not trying to hear both sides or all sides of an issue. They're, they're just trying to be comfortable and hear things they agree with. And I wish it weren't the case, but that is how the great majority of folks are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're social animals. We look for our social groups that support our existing views. And that's what the vast majority of people probably have always done. Right. Um, so the question is, for those of us who don't want to be like that, who want to, ha want to weigh and balance many sources of information and make our own decisions mm -hmm. and try to get the highest quality information we can, whether it agrees with ourselves or with our current views or not, mm -hmm. The question is, can we do that? Mm -hmm. Is there any way to do that? Most people aren't even going to try. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's in the early days of the internet, it was kind of a golden age. Um, it was a free, it was a, most of the people on were people who were open-minded and really wanted to have serious discussions. Mm -hmm. the, the folks who had, uh, who were less interested in ideas weren't on yet, right? They just hadn't picked up on it yet. Mm -hmm. They were still watching television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there was no censorship at that time. So it was a wonderful time for exploration of ideas by people who care about uh, high quality concepts mm -hmm. and how actually um, to move forward uh, with high quality information learning things, learning, right? Learning means you didn't know it before. In other words, uh, it's, uh, it's new information that contradicts something before. Mm. So you have, in order to do any learning, you have to be tolerant of these, of contradictions, right? Yeah. So, um, those were a golden time. It was a wonderful time on the internet. You could have very serious discussions and make progress. Mm -hmm. Now you, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. There's a, what also too is what you're highlighting is as we learn things, there's a certain unlearning needing to be done. Um, and when you right. say, and when you say the golden age, you know, of the web or, or uh, of the web, I'm assuming, um, or the internet, um, was this also, you know, I don't know, did you get, how did you gather inspiration for op the term open source? Because there was also, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's also during this time of, you know, trying to, of course, find the right term for it. 
for this kinds of um, keeping the uh, the technology free and accessible, etc. I'm just kind of want to know what the uh, the the general feeling or questions that was going on this time. Yeah. Well, in these early days, the uh, the term that was uh, the only term that was used for that type of software was free software. Now, mm-hmm. and that term worked really well for programmers. Uh, they understood what it meant. Mm-hmm. Um, they understood that the word free there meant free as in freedom, and that it did not necessarily refer to the price of the software. Sure. Um, but if you're a programmer, um, that type of software is also zero cost because you know how to take uh, to take source code and turn it into code that can run on a computer. That's something you know how to do. Mm -hmm. So for you as a programmer back then, the term free software worked both ways. It worked as free as in freedom. You had freedom to change it. It also worked as free as in price because you knew how to use it. The conflict arose, the problem came about when more people who were not programmers started to use that software because for them, the free as in price was not true. They had to pay someone else to set it up for them to make it possible to use the free software. Mm. And so companies were being founded to try to help consumers use this software. Mm. But then they had to go to the potential customers and say, use our free software, it costs this much money. Now you can imagine that did not fly, right? You can't go to someone and in the in English in the English language you cannot say something is free and then try to charge money for it. People just decide you're ripping them off, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now this problem does not arise in some other languages. In Spanish, they have two different words for free as in freedom or free as in price. So in Spanish, the term free software works great because you just use the freedom version and you're fine Mm. Um, in english though they're the same word which is unfortunate yeah so what it became clear that consumers and were just not buying this because the term was confusing to them and in fact made them feel ripped off so it was necessary from a marketing perspective to come up with a different term and many different terms were suggested um um, I believe Michael Tiemann, who is very prominent in that space, suggested the term sourceware, which is fine and would have totally done the job. Mm-hmm. Um, I suggested open source software um, and I wasn't even involved in the decision. The community made the decision what term to use, mm-hmm. um, but, but it did the job. Basically, it gave us a term to use that didn't, aff- didn't upset the consumers. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't actively misleading and confusing because of this very unfortunate clash in the U.S. in the American language um, in English between free as in free and free as in price. That's really interesting, uh, and I didn't think about the you know the the wording because yeah, English is the same word but two different ideas. Um, so in general. Free software is, it's, you know, you have basically control, uh, it's, uh, it's available, easily available, uh, the source code can be easily accessible to really anyone. Um, and then open source code is essentially, you know, it's still accessible, um, but it's, 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 you know, people are editing it for quality. It's not necessarily, um, not, it's unlike the, the free software it is. Um, where its hallmark is that it's just free and accessible and, you know, people have rights to the, so- to the source. Code. Well, it's it, the way these definitions are made mm-hmm. is they're based on the, the license that whoever, if you're a programmer, you write this code and then you select a license for it. Mm. And there are different licenses. Um, most, uh, and they're mostly very similar Um, the free software license and the open source licenses are mostly very similar licenses. Um, There are some minor differences, Mm -hmm. but for your average person, they they all look the same. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say to a programmer, 
um, if we had someone from the Free Software Foundation here right now to talk with, they would probably say that the quality of their free software uh, is about the same as regular open source software. Mm -hmm. They feel they work just as hard on it. So it, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a quality difference. It's more about the details of the license and exactly what you're allowed to do with it. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. And I, and I think that's also really great for people listening or watching is to, there's a, there's a difference between these two. And as you were talking, I was thinking of um, a good friend, Treat Krim. Uh, he's a uh, tech entrepreneur. He's you know, part of Web 2.0. And uh, he told me once is uh, technology is public infrastructure. And you know, from our discussion, now I'm thinking, oh, then we can kind of see perhaps where it switched over from public, or it could be, is public infrastructure, free software to more, you know, privatized, kind of going to private companies, organizations, et cetera. So I'm just, perhaps there's a, maybe this is the moment when there's a switch in how we view technology, perhaps. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, um, you can extend, obviously, the open source concept uh, to any kinds of technology, right? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily software. Right. Uh, and it and it is it has it has spread to a wide variety of of types of software or processes in general. So that term is now out there for many areas. Mm -hmm. um, and the question in any given case for and this is the this comes up for any creator of technology, right? Do you want to make this proprietary so that you can have a certain pathway to um, profiting, making a living off this technology directly mm -hmm. uh, through ownership of it? Or do you think that the right path for this technology is to put it into basically a version of the public domain uh, and declare it to be an open source technology and, and assign it a license that allows um, widespread use without payments to yourself? Mm -hmm. And, and any, any creator has that decision Say you know similarly to artists, right? They can decide to either copyright their work, or they can put a Creative Commons license on it mm -hmm. that allows um, derivative works. Um, and sometimes uh, some of those licenses allow people to use the work in any way without any credit to the originator of any kind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So any creator, whether it's physical technology or even artistic uh, endeavors has this decision. Who is going to own my work? How is it licensed? What am I going to allow other people to do with the work? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very personal decision, right? I mean, some, some folks have the freedom to, uh, you know, they don't need a stream of income perhaps. They can just say, hey, I'm donating this to the world. Um, others, you know, are, are not in that position. They need to make a living off their work. And the vast majority of people, of course, are in that position. So they don't have the freedom, perhaps. They may not feel they have the freedom. Um, in the software world, you can make it open source and then open, offer consulting services to help people use it. And many people do that. And that's a, a, a nice compromise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And what you're highlighting also reminds me of, um, you know, in, you know, um, GitHub, you know, they have, mm -hmm. um, so many different developers, so many different projects. Um, it's easily accessible, you know, and, you know, before it was like, okay, people would of course contribute for interesting projects, you know, contribute to the community. What I think is so fascinating is, you know, some people now can make a living off of, you know, people will donate to their work, which I think is, I mean, it's amazing to come to think. It's like, you know, the patrons of the arts, you know, back in, you know, the, the Medici era, era, you know, of, of being a patron to the arts. Um, so more and more developers are earning their income this way. Some people are doing it full time, which is uh, inc incredible. So I'm just thinking is uh, usually technology companies are kind of locking people in, or I'm sorry, developers, engineers, and you know, perhaps the next wave or a couple waves later will be developers, engineers working for projects that people 
believe are a priority. I mean, I don't know, I'm thinking just climate change or climate security um, tools or all anything that has to do with maybe public goods or uh, health care, these kinds of things. I don't know. It's just kind of an interesting thought that you inspired. Yeah, yeah they are. That is, that is an interesting uh, pathway. And I think um, another pathway we're seeing that complements that is the DAOs, um, these autonomous organizations um, that are um, that are arising in the crypto space. Mm. These are very grassroots voluntary voluntary organizations what are, that what are start DAOs? up. What are DAOs? I'm sorry. What are DAOs? Um, DAOs. Um, I forget what the D stands for, which is, I should know that, but it's, it's, uh, these are talking. It's always, you know, never, it's never there when you're talking with somebody. (laughs) Right. Right. So the AO is autonomous organizations. And, um, so, uh, these are, they started in the crypto space, uh, and these are very grassroots, um, they start out as voluntary associations where people just start working on a project. Uh, and then it's owned by the group, depending on how much uh, each person has already invested into the into the group. Mm. And they vote on everything. Um, and you can start out as a volunteer and then end up with a paid position in these. So this is this is um, this is in the in the crypto world, which to me it's uh, kind of the wild west right now, which uh, you know has its pros and cons, of course, but. Um, there's a tremendous amount of innovation. Mm-hmm. Right. I think it's decent. Maybe it's decentralized, decentralized yeah. autonomous organizations. That could be what the D is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's sort of taking the open source uh, model and taking it another step out in terms of applying um, mm-hmm. applying this sort of uh, freedom of association and group decision-making that you see in open source software, applying it now to areas that extend their software base, but they extend extend beyond that. Mm -hmm. Different applications. Yeah, yeah, for example, you can use this this type of thing to do uh, investments, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Future Brain Trust, uh, we're about revisioning human culture Right? We believe that there are alternative futures. There's not just one singular future. And you know, one of it is understanding that technology, of course, affects culture and vice versa. So when you're talking about DAOs, it's, it's you know, will technology kind of create these small groups of people that make decisions on not just you know, investing, but you know, other kinds of uh, decisions. And it, you know, it's, yeah, I guess it's kind of a cultural, moment when people are you know understanding that things can be different you know in in their investment or finance but also how they make decisions as a group or as an individual yeah yeah and we're we are increasingly sidestepping some of the power structures that are in place i think we've seen that with crypto and banking and the traditional finance world um people are realizing wait a minute with crypto, I can actually hold my funds personally. It's not at a bank. I have it myself. It's a big responsibility. And obviously a lot of people don't want to do that and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But for those who do, um, it's a big difference to take personal responsibility and personal um, direct ownership and holding of your own assets. Um, it's It's a real revolution. And I think we can see that uh, once people take that attitude in their financial world, they want to extend it to other areas, for example, their healthcare. Um, The idea that there's a bunch of folks in Washington, DC, who'd get to decide whether I'm allowed to use stem cells, right? Whether I'm allowed to use exosomes, whether I'm allowed to use peptides, instead of me making those decisions for myself. Um, increasingly, I think, especially to young people, they look at that and go, what is this? This is nuts. You know, I can make these decisions for myself. Mm. Um, and if necessary, they just go outside the United States to get those treatments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, um, you know, 
kind of switching gears, is this also kind of what inspired your interest, you know, and in, in experience in nanotechnology? Just kind of understanding that literally the the world can be rearranged differently. We just have to figure out how to arrange it in a in a certain kind of way to get a certain kind of output. Right. Um, I think the original inspiration from my perspective, why that seems so important to me, and this is still true, is that once you start thinking of the world in, uh, in that perspective with a molecular nanotechnology uh, lens, it becomes clear that the vast majority of uh, chemical pollution is completely unnecessary. We do not need to do that. There, it's not required by the laws of physics. Um, there's, there are certain types of, the only type of pollution that is required by the laws of physics is heat, right? We all know about thermodynamics and heat is a byproduct of many things. So we need to be able to get rid of excess heat, mm -hmm. but there are ways to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and at the very least, we can greatly reduce and eventually eliminate chemical pollution, mm -hmm. uh, which is a stunning concept, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the idea that you can have a high level of technology and a high, very high standard of living physically um, without having to pollute our environment. Isn't that a dream, a wonderful vision for a future? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's worth, to me, a great deal of effort. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, yeah, I've put in a great deal of effort and I continue to do that. Yeah. And you're, again, you're inspiring other people, which I mean, is again, it's the kind of ripple effect. Yeah. Yes, and um, I did run Foresight for like 30 years on and off, but I have now officially stepped back and, and the new generation has picked up the ball and running fast. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm very proud of the, uh, you know, the millennial crowd who have uh, taken over with the Gen Zs also. Mm -hmm. um, they, are, they are running Foresight now and I'm thrilled to say they're doing a better job than I ever did. I'm so happy. Well, again, you should be really proud of the team at Foresight, but then also, of course, yourself. I mean, it's, uh, again, from what I've read about you online, I did a bit of my research, is it, you know, it sounds like in the best way possible, it sounds like a really great DIY journey in the best way possible of just uh, following your interests, following the things that you believe in. Um, yeah, I think it's just an incredible journey. Uh, that you've been on and I mean continue on thankfully it is yeah. it's been incredible and it, you're right it does continue to be wonderful I uh, I can still pitch in on foresight as I as needed or as desired mm -hmm. uh, but I have my I have a huge amount of freedom and time now to pursue new interests whether that's mm -hmm. uh, rejuvenation technology tell, yeah, tell, us, um, tell me about you know the things that you're focusing on right now yeah right so um as we all know, uh, the uh, developed world healthcare system, uh, at least here in the West, is basically a sick care system, right? When you, you get ill, you go to the doctor, they give you a pill, or maybe they cut you up. So that's, that's our model for healthcare. <clears throat> and uh, they, do, mm, they take a bit different approach in the East. But uh, what we need to do is come at this very differently and say, all right, rather than focus on illnesses, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to look at what are the conditions that create health and how can we maintain health indefinitely, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a physical process. Mm -hmm. There's no, again, there's no physical law that says we have to be sick. There's no physical law that says we have to age. Um, Time has to pass, but we do not have to become frail necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do have to do is do a lot of basic science to figure out, all right, what are these processes that are driving the, uh, the, uh, this, this, the various ways in which we decline over time, right? And there's a lot of them. There's at least seven or eight or nine. You'll hear these big debates about what is the number, but it's, it's not infinite. Right. And it's it's not even necessarily 50. You can you can figure out what these processes are and figure out ways to intervene in them. And we're doing a great job on that uh, already on model animals. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out humans and mice are actually very different. Uh, laboratory mice, I think they all die of cancer. And that is not true for for humans. So um, mm -hmm. 
you know, we, you can't just take animal models and say, well, we've solved it here and now we can do it for people. But we all know that. But um, pr- huge advances are being made and more and more funding is flowing into the space. Not so much government funding, but private funding. Mm-hmm. A lot of private funding is flowing into the space, probably because people are finally realizing that, oh, wait, we actually are making major progress here. You know, this is not something that we won't see results on for decades. I expect to see the beginnings of um, of products and services that we can use today. In fact, there are early ones for the pioneers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned if you're willing to go outside the U.S. in particular, mm-hmm. um, you can get some pretty edgy stuff. And like, a lot like of folks I know I'm do curious. that. I'm curious, like what? Well, we mentioned before, we mentioned stem cells, we mentioned exosomes, we mentioned um, peptides. These things were done in the U.S., but the FDA has decided in its great wisdom that um, that we're not allowed to have that anymore. So now we're going to have to go outside the U.S. Mm. Um, but if you don't have to go very far, um, uh, you just have to be really, really smart about your own quality control. You know, if you're going to go against the guidance of the FDA. If you're going to do that, you have to know what you're doing, right? Nobody's watching out for you. You're making your own decisions and you're taking your own risks. So you have to do a lot of homework Mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, if you choose not to follow FDA guidelines, if you do decide to go outside the U.S., you have to really know what you're doing. Um, but you know, if you, if the information is out there, you can make those decisions for yourself. If mm-hmm. you do that homework, mm-hmm. it's really interesting what you said, uh, conditions of, of health. I think that's such, again, it's such a different point of view. It reminds me of your, the point of view of, you know, coping versus oh, let's create, um, conditions of health versus, you know, what current system is just looking at what's going wrong and just looking at what's going wrong rather than what's going right in a healthy individual or in a healthy body. Interesting. Right. It is interesting. And um, there's one fundamental understanding that more and more people have, which is if you look at the great majority of diseases and illnesses that people get, they almost always correlate with age, right? There are a few childhood, you know, childhood cancers, things like that. There's a few of them, Mm -hmm. but the vast majority of illnesses correlate with age. Uh, what that means is there, you know, if we can figure out what those processes are that are causing us to become weakened in various parts of our of our body, especially the immune system is a key one, right? Mm. As we've seen with COVID, right? Um, the big the big factor for COVID problems is age. The other one is obesity, which is I think of, of obesity as sort of a form of accelerated aging in a way. Mm. So. Um, If we can tackle aging, we get and do it successfully, we get all we we get rid of all these illnesses sort of um, as a side benefit. You know, cancer goes away, the great majority of it, heart disease, um, dementia, you know, COPD, you name it. They all correlate with age. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that means is that if we can tackle that, we get tremendous bonuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people, you know, taking the, it it is um, a a certain risk going outside of FDA regulations, you know, what governments would advise, um, but it's, um, it's, it's pioneering, it's, it's really understanding that, um, you know, there are limits that we have for ourselves now, but just because we set these limits doesn't mean that's, that's where it actually is, and the same thing with aging or understanding how our bodies work. Um, again, I, again, I think that's just a really great reminder f- for people, well, for me anyway. Um, so I know you're um, writing a book right now, or you finished the book, right? There is a draft. We have a draft. We have a first draft. We it love is first now, drafts, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the first step. Okay. Um, it is now with our, we have a, a small group of folks uh, maybe 30 or so who are um, going through it now, helping us improve it. Okay. Um, and eventually we're planning an audio book. And uh, at some point we plan to do a paper book, but we don't want to wait for that because uh, traditional book publishers just take forever to get a book out. 
and uh, we just can't wait that long. We need to move forward. Right, right. Release that information so it can get legs right. on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so one final question before uh, I let you go. Um, so Future Brain Trust, again, is about revisioning human culture. I'm curious of, you know, your vision of, of human culture. What does that look like? Wow, it's a big, um, a big question. Um, I think what we, we need to do a couple of things um, in order to get the positive future that we would, we all want. Um, somehow, we have to maintain human freedoms, freedom to innovate, um, and the world is sort of going in the other direction right now. Um, I think authoritarianism is on the rise. Um, we've talked earlier about the divisions in democracies, the polarization. So somehow uh, we have to rein that in and, and move back toward a positive building vision. Uh, and I think w one of the drivers of the problems we've got is, and, and this is no insight on my part, we all know this, is that we're seeing a lot of... Um, increases in inequality. We are seeing a lot of folks who are not able to benefit from uh, the economy that we have, the 21st century economy. They're not participating. They're not succeeding. And they're angry, understandably so, and their voting reflects that. So that's going to continue until we find a way for those folks to participate. Uh, in our book, we suggest the concept uh, not of universal basic income, but of universal basic capital. Um, and rather, I won't get into that now. You know, those of the folks who are interested can read the book when it comes out mm -hmm. or hear the audio book. But um, the goal is to make sure everyone has a stake in the system succeeding. Uh, everyone mm -hmm. has some capital. If you look into the future, mm -hmm. it's pretty clear that human labor in many forms is going to be replaced by machines increasingly, not all forms, but a lot of it, right? Sure, sure. How are we going to enable people to have a have a good life mm -hmm. if they can't use if they can't exchange their labor for income? Mm. And that's what drove the universal basic capital concept. Ah, so so that's vital. We have to enable people vote, you know, if you have a voter, that voter has to have a way to make a living or those votes are going to be angry votes mm -hmm. and understandably so, right? Mm -hmm. So that we have to fix that problem. Um, if we can fix that problem, uh, then we have the freedom to tackle physical problems. Um, we can clean up uh, the Earth's environment. Um, and that's not just getting rid of greenhouse gases. That's not even our biggest problem. We have problems that are bigger than that even. Yeah. So um, get rid of chemical pollution, expand, um, expand the, in, the uh, habitat for wildlife, all these things. Uh, move polluting industries off the, off the surface of this most precious planet that we have, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, many, so many things we can do, and those are physical things uh, that are much easier to solve than human problems, right? They're, they're, they're engineering tasks. We can do these things, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, if you add those two things together, tackle the human problem, tackle the physical problems, I think the uh, human future could be very bright. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think so too. I really think so too. Um, and it's, you know, if a final thought too is... Um, you know, it sounds like, you know, we have the engineering to tackle, you know, things like these very big things like climate security. Um, but then there's also kind of the tangle of organizing the humans uh, to to facilitate and solve those challenges. Um, but, you know, like you said, I, you know, I think there's a, a bright future because, you know, we're we understand the 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 power of collaboration. I think we're starting to understand a bit more about that. Um, thank you. Uh, also, wait, one final question. Can you give us a hint about what you mean by universal human capital? Um, 
Uh, yeah, universal basic capital. Universal basic capital. Um, right. So the concept, we all, I think, are, have heard of universal basic income, which is basically giving everyone some kind of, uh, some kind of income stream that is consistent that they can count on. Mm. And the problem with that is that you start it and it goes forever. And where does all, this is an immense amount of money, really stunning amount of money. Um, and where does all that come from? Well, it's got to come from people who have a lot of money and are they going to support this? Well, probably not because it means they're going to lose all their money. Mm. So this may never pass. Okay. Cause the wealthy folks are going to look at that and go, you know, that's great, but I'm going to be, that just makes everybody poor. What sense does this really make? So, so it's a problem. It's a problem with the UBI concept is the cost and where does that money come from? Mm -hmm. um, the universal basic capital concept would be that we do, we want to locate a sort uh, if possible, a new source of, uh, of, of, of resources that isn't just taking money away from wealthy people. So find a new, a new source of resources and then do a one-time distribution. Um, is and it, is there it is space, a space, is it space resources? It's space resources. Bingo. You win the, you win the game. I, you got the concept. I know. I'll tell you, Christine, I got into water a couple of years ago and I, it actually started with space because I was like thinking like, that's a lot of resources. That's a lot of money. How, who's, who's going to get the money? So anyway, okay. Anyway. Right. And, and that is the good question. Who is going to get the money? Do we do it by like homesteading where mm. whoever gets there first gets, gets it? Is it a winner take all scenario? Um, mm. Anyway, so that's the, uh, that's the basic concept. Um, it is an extremely ambitious concept, but um, that's what we came up with and we're throwing it out there for discussion and consideration. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I mean, I'm really looking forward to reading, so. Uh, Great. Thank you. A wonderful conversation. Thank you. Oh, it's been great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, have a good rest of your morning and good rest of your weekend. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Christine.